Well, I want to tell you first about myself and then about the work. I'm really very happy to be here uh, for a surprising reason. I started college as a drama major. Yay! Yes, wow. yes. Awesome. And uh, I, I've been here but a little while, but I've come full of devotion to meet and know a man of whom the world speaks with such reverence. That's a line from <laughs> Faust that uh, I was in, in uh, many, many years ago. And I uh, was forced, against my will, uh, to take an introductory psychology course because it was required. And it had a section in it on learning and memory. And I thought, this is great, because now I'll know how to memorize my lines and remember them. I thought the rules were going to be right there. <laughs> and I got trapped by it because I got interested then in learning and memory. And I kept, I was also a minor in music, and I kept drama and music as a minor and as a hobby the rest of my life, really. I still, I sang in the Pacific Chorale, and I currently play in the Laguna concert band and a swing band and a jazz band. So I kept music and some drama the rest of my life. But I lost contact with the formal acting, unless you call being a professor as a form of acting, I suppose. Uh, wouldn't you think? Yeah. 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 I think it is. I think it is. Now, my, my uh, special interest uh, remained in, in memory. And uh, just think about it for a moment. The most complicated structure that anybody knows about in the universe is the human brain. There isn't anything that anybody knows of that approaches the complexity of the brain. And guess what the most important thing is that the brain does? It does lots of things, but the most important is memory. Because if you don't have memory, you're not you. You're not anything. You, you wouldn't even be a flower, because a flower can uh, survive in the atmosphere, and you can't. You have to have memory in order to survive, to know what to do, how to behave, how to get food, how to get water, all the rest. It's just critical. So I put those <coughs> two together in my own thinking. And, and fortunately, in 1964, I was invited by the Dean of Biological Sciences to form the first department ever in the history of, of education uh, to focus on uh, brain and behavior. And I started in a, a large and vigorous research group, and others did too in the department, trying to figure out how the brain does it. Now, in, in the course of this, I'll, I'll get to what my major findings are in a minute, but the, in the course of this, we and a lot of other people throughout the world learned that uh, memory is not memory. Uh, memory is lots of things. We have different kinds of memory. We have short-term memory so that you could, you could echo me, uh, and as actors, you could do it with precision. You could mimic me, and that short-term memory allows you to do that. You can remember tomorrow that I was here today. And you couldn't mimic me, because all you can remember is that I was here and some things about it. And the processes underlying those two forms of memory are really quite different. We also have, that, that's one way of looking at memory. Another way of looking at it is we have uh, a lot of memory of facts, things that um, you just have around you all the time. Uh, you may your, know your address, for example, but you don't remember when you learned it. And if you grew up in the United States, you know that George Washington was the first president, but you don't remember when you learned it. You just know that. Just, you just know that. So that's a form of memory. You have a lot of these memories. They're stored away for which you have no real record of. They're just there. Uh, I ask you your name. Uh, that's just there. You don't remember when you learn your, your name. Uh, so we, we have that kind of memory. And that we also have autobiographical memory, memory in which we can specify what and when we learned something. And that's where we dive into our past and we pull out information. So, oh, yes, I met that person before. I know where it was. It was a restaurant. And I remember the conversation that we had at that time. And you're pulling that out of your brain, out of your brain when you're doing that. Now, 
I'm, I'm describing it right now, and but what I'm saying also is that those of us who work in the neurobiology of learning and memory focus on different aspects of that. You can't, you can't study everything about it. You have to decide what aspect of memory you want to work on. Are you interested in, in uh, learning uh, what the, the basis of a very recent memory, or what's the basis of this long-term memory, what's the basis of the formation of long-term memory, and so on. All of these are very separate questions. Now, when, when you think about, or when I think about uh, acting, uh, you've, you've got to reach in and, and dig from your own past things that are appropriate for the character that you're creating. And if you can't do that, you can't do it. Now, you can fake it. You can say, oh, I would, I would, uh, I would like to be uh, Mrs. Washington, for example. And in order to do that, you have to start thinking about what are, what are the kinds of things which would be appropriate for Mrs. Washington, who had been married before and is now married to the general, and so on. And then you have to create an artificial autobiography for that. And then you have to embed that with some facts about it. It's not just that you are Mrs. Uh, Washington's uh, wife, uh, but you own slaves. And you live right next to a river. And you have to create all of these things so that when you, when you finally develop your character, you have this richness of the world, not just that you memorize the lines that you have when you walk on stage. Now, th this is my take on it. I'm, I'm no longer in drama, so if I'm way off base, you have to tell me. But, but that's sort of the way I look at it. If I were in drama today, that's what I would do. I would, I would get a character, and then I would create an autobiography based on all of the facts that I have available and then create a world which is like my own world. So that I say, yes, I'm Mrs. Washington, and you could then interrogate me and say, where do you live? Oh, I live on a beautiful river. And uh, well, how do you take care of the house? Well, I don't have to worry about that because we have 83 slaves and, and they live in these little places outside the house and we take very good care of them and so on. And my husband you know, used to be a general, but now he's president of the United States and so on. And you have a narrative that you can talk about, which is your character, which goes well beyond the lines that you may have learned. And it's my belief, and you, you now can correct me if you disagree and if you think I'm wrong, it's my belief that this is essential in being able to be a performer. It's just essential to, to do that. If, if you are a solitary person walking on a stage. Now, uh, I'm not so sure that that's necessary if we go back to Roman times and you have a chorus that's doing things. I'm not so sure that a chorus has to do that. Uh, I used to sing in the Pacific Chorale and um, I didn't know the meaning of a lot of the things that we sang in Latin. I, I could guess because I had studied uh, uh, Spanish and Italian and, and so I could kind of guess what was going on, but it was not essential to the singing of it. What was essential for the singing of it was the emotional part of it. If, you be a, if you're a singer in an important chorale like that, you have to have the emotion that goes along with it. You don't need to know the content. I think it's different if you're a soloist. I think it's different if you're a character on the stage. There you have to have much more surrounding you about the knowledge about it. Um, I learned um, a lot of, I studied, I studied voice uh, in, in college and, and afterwards, so I learned a lot of German songs. And I also studied German. A and I found that the meaning of the songs that I was singing enriched the singing. You know, Still wie die Nacht, how still the night is. You know, it makes a difference if you're saying Still wie die Nacht, what the hell does that mean? I'll just go and pronounce it correctly as opposed to thinking, the still of the night, it's not wonderful. Deep as the sea, you know, and you can think about how still as a night and deep as the sea, which means a lot more than just reciting the words of it. So that I think that the point I'm making here, I think that the solo, the solo as an actor, the solo as a singer, makes a difference. And I think you need to have a richer perspective, a richer knowledge, a richer background, and the more the better. So if I were an actor today and I would s assign a part, and it may be just a, you know, a third level part of some kind, I would go about creating the character. 
I would create an, autobiograph an autobiographical experience so that I could call on that when I think about my, what should I do, how should I walk across the stage, and so on. You can do that if you've built an autobiography about that and you know who that person is. So that's, that's sort of my take on it. Now there's a, a feature of all of this that I have worked on all of my academic career and that, that is the issue of uh, <clears throat> how, how you make strong memories uh, in the first place because memories are so important there are two existence. And there are two major ways to do that. And one is rehearsal will do that and then the rehearsal will just give you these factual informations. When you rehearse, you just re rehearse lines. That's all there is to it. The other one is you make strong memories when you are emotionally aroused. And we know the mechanisms in the brain that allow that to happen. That's been my field. That's all what I've been worked on uh, all my life. But think about it for a moment. <clears throat> I say, um, well, it's interesting to be here. And then I say, uh, uh, this is not true, but I'm going to say something which is not true, but I'm going to say it for. <laughs> right? I say, I've just been here a few minutes, and. Uh, I'm going to have to leave because I think you're really stupid people. And I don't like to be with stupid people, so I'm going to go. Thank you very much. All right. Now, you're likely to remember what I just said more than anything else that I said. Because when I said that, you got a little tangle here. You felt a little funny. Couldn't you? How many of you felt funny when I said that? You felt a little funny. That's adrenaline. I released adrenaline from your adrenal gland by insulting you, and that happens all the time. You do it when you get excited, you do it when you get embarrassed, you do it when you get insulted, you do it when you get angry. Any kind of an emotional state, when it's turned on, it's got to be a, a turn on that does it, that's going to cause the release of adrenaline, and now we know that that will create a very strong memory of that episode. That's going to be part of your life. And we know the mechanisms by which it, it does it because that's the research that I've done all my life. Adrenaline turns on a specific region of the brain right in here that's shaped like an almond and it's called the amygdala which is Greek for almond. When that gets turned on, the projections from that region of the brain, it's a little tiny region of the brain on both sides over here, when that gets turned on it sends out messages to every other region of the brain and it says in effect Something very important happened, remember it. And that induces changes within those other brain regions that hold that information. So emotional excitement will create uh, strong memories and we understand the mechanisms by which it does it. So you get aroused, you're going to have a long-term memory which is going to be better. Um, you want to remember something the slow way, uh, rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and you'll build in a, a memory which doesn't have any autobiographical character. It just has a, f a factual character. Now in the case of the lines that I, I recited to you from Faust, if they are correct, I'll have to look them up one of these days. <laughs> uh, I've been here but a little while and but have come full of devotion to me to know a man of whom the world speaks with such reverence. I'm saying hello to Faust and this. Um, I also have an autobiographical memory. I, know, I, also, I know the lines, I think they're correct, but I have an autobiographical memory because I remember being on the stage doing that. You know, and I, I can see myself in leotards, if you can imagine, uh, walking across the stage, uh, introducing myself to Faust. Uh, so you got both kinds of memories mixed up here. You got an autobiographical memory and then you have just a factual memory. And uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if they're correct, but they could be. They could be correct because we could look at the record. I was at San Jose State University, which had a really good drama department in those days. And uh, we could look at the record and see who played uh, in Faust because it's in the record and I presume they're going to find it was me. And uh, uh, you could look up the, the play and I think you're going to find that those lines are in the play. So there's a mixture of the autobiographical and a mixture of, of the factual. And that's, that's the way we live our lives. We live our lives by having information, some information which is available 
and then we go into there, draw that information out, and then we represent it at the time. Now, it may not always be factual, so I ask you to remember um, your fifth grade teacher. <coughs> How many of you think you can remember the fifth grade teacher? Do you remember being in the class? Do you remember, how many of you remember where you sat? Can you sort of see the room? All right, you do an autobiographical memory, which is built on a fact, right? So the fact is that you had a teacher. And the fact is, how many of you remember the fifth grade teacher's name? All right, and we could, we could check that. And now you're, you're dredging up an autobiographical memory of being in the room, which is different from the fact that you were in, the, in that grade and the fact that you had a teacher. You had a, a teacher in that room, and you go through some kind of process to pull that information. Yeah, I'm sitting in the fifth grade, and the teacher's in the front, and, and this guy that I hate is over on the right, and, you know, <laughs> all right. Okay, and, and I, as I'm not in the acting business, as you know, because I left it a long time ago, but that's my take on it. My take on it is that you've got you've to you've gotta create a new real life for yourself. That's what it has to, has to do. You have to create a, a, real, a real new life, and it's very different from just learning lines. And it's different from just walking across the stage. I remember when I, uh, and I was in lots of plays uh, because I started when I was in junior high school and in high school and in college. And I directed plays. And I remember a, a key to all of this is motivation. So you want to have the people move around the stage in a way that makes a lot of sense. You know, people just don't stand when they're acting, they move and they do that. But the director that I learned from and then the direction that I taught when I was a director was it's got to be motivated. And what does that mean? It just doesn't mean I've decided to move from here to there. That's not motivation. Well, I think it's important that I go pick up this object, which is different from saying I'm going to walk across the stage. It's important that I do this. And when you do that, then you create real characters that you can believe and that the, that the audience can believe. And it's quite different from a director saying, now, in order to balance out the stage, we have to have two people here and one person over on, on stage right. And then when they speak to you, turn around at the right time and look at them. Well, that's mechanical. That's like, I don't know, it's just, just purely mechanical. And what you really want is for the person who walks across the stage to walk across because I want to get the hell away from this person who's bothering me or because there's something over here which I find more interesting and that should be real to you on the stage. Real to you. Now, if you have a performance that goes for two or three years, the reality gets lost and it becomes very mechanical after a while, like riding a bike, but it was created with this, the realness was created with the realness. And if it isn't created with the realness, the audience is going to see that. And it's going to be people just walking around and reciting lines as opposed to believing for the moment they're, that they're on stage that this is their life. Believing that this artificial life really is their life. And in my view, that, that's critical to uh, quality acting. So that's my take on all of this. Not, not bad for a researcher who's not a, a, a dramatic artist. Or at least Sounds hasn't like been. He is. I, yeah, he's <laughs> talked like a dramatic artist. So I'd like to frame up um, uh, before I open up to everybody. Uh, just I want to point one thing out, and that is you said that we learn our. So autobiographical memory is, I think, a term that we can actually incorporate because that's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's what we're doing when we create our memories. We're creating autobiographical memory. But. Dr. McGaugh said um, something very interesting. He said, you need to create an autobiographical experience. I don't yeah. know if you heard yourself say yeah. that or not. Yeah. And what's important to me about that is here we have this man who has a very strong perspective on how human behavior occurs on a daily basis from the learning and memory, from the field of learning and memory. And so it's easy for him to say, yes, behavior is all about these memories, your past experiences. 
And as he's describing the memories that he thinks are the most um, uh, inactive or most valuable to, to be able to create behavior on stage of, of Martha Washington, he's, he's talking about the experiences that she has. Um, and so I just want to point that out because um, many of us, uh, and, and maybe not, but I have been exposed in the past to this idea of backstory. That's been taught many times. What does your character do for a living? And, it, and to me, it's always been taught as a list of facts. No, I take, it, I take it farther than that. Well, and what we're yeah. doing here, what's new now, yeah. is what you're talking yeah. about, which is what is your autobiographical experience? We're actually creating events yeah. from our character's past lives. Yes. Yes. And then we're encoding them with emotion, yeah. which yeah. is the second part of what you just talked about. It's how yeah. do we make these long-lasting memories. Yeah. No, for me, it's it's not just it's not a back it's just not a, a backstory in the sense I got to have a list. I'm, I'm this, I'm this. I have three children. I, no, uh, if if I were the director, now, and and I've got you in a leading role, and I would sit you down and say, uh, where were you 15? Where did you live 15 years ago? What were you doing? Uh, what did you go to college? What what was it like your first year in college? your character, not you, your character, and find out if you've really created a life that you can call on because it is your, your real experiences make you who you are, your memories. All of, all of your experiences create memories and that's who you are. Now if you have a character, then you have to have the same thing for the character, you see. And, and you have to pull your, yourself out of who you are and you have to pull yourself into this fictional character. And to do it, it just doesn't mean you get an accent and, and that you memorize some lines. It means that you, in interrogate it, you should be able to give pretty, pretty good responses, as I just did for, for Martha Washington. You know, we got slaves. Oh, the, oh the, the, the head slave is the sweetest lady, you know. We're even thinking about setting her free one of these days, you know. Uh, I think you have to do that. Do you disagree with me? I'm looking for. Well, you better not, because that's what we're learning in this class. So. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so shall we? Uh, is it okay? Can we open up the questions? Yeah, of course. Now about, I, 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 okay. I was hoping that. Would yeah, be. yeah. Of course. Okay. So, yeah. 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 So, <clears throat> as someone, you know, you're in your own mind, and you can't really like create something that's not there. How do you kind of create another person's life? with the raw materials of, you know, what you know as a person? If it's, if it's in your culture and there's something that you can understand around you, you can do it. If, you, if it's not in your culture, then you have to study about it. For example, if you're going to uh, play somebody, uh, the, if the play takes place in, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, then you have to learn something about Burling, Birmingham, Alabama. You have to learn something about the, the culture of it. What kind of food do they eat? Uh, what are the holidays that they celebrate? And so on. It, it takes some background information so that you can begin to live in that particular culture. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, it takes place in Queens, New York, that's a very, very different culture. And you have to learn what that, that culture is. And, and um, I found that as a, as a West Coast person, I grew up in, in Arizona, Southern Arizona and uh, California, that it was very difficult for me to understand what was going on in New York. New York was not, not part of my uh, living. I don't think I could have played a character from New York. I didn't have enough background or information to deal with it. I think I could do it now because I'm older and I've, I'm more familiar with traveling and so on. Um, it's very hard if you're not part of the culture in, in which the, the play uh, is placed. But it's something you have to do. Otherwise, you're just faking it, uh, uh, spouting some lines, and maybe learning a southern accent uh, without knowing what it, what it really means when you use the words. Look, I, I make no mistake about it. I think that acting is very, very hard. I mean, this, this is, it's not just standing up and reciting lines and walking across the stage. Real acting, I think, is just a hell of a difficult job because you have so much personal homework to do. And, and uh, 
Uh, just from my own reading, I know that actors and actresses turn down very important parts because they don't feel they can, that they can get into. They don't feel that they have the background which would enable them to play that particular part, even though it looks very juicy. Uh, but uh, I guess the simple answer is hard work. <laughs> you, 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 what, I, what I don't think an actor should do is fake it. And, and that's what a lot do. You just learn the lines and get some gestures to go along with it. I think you have to feel it. I'm of the old school. I really think you have to feel what you're doing. I am that person. And I've got these autobiographical memories. I know that I'm not really that person. But when I'm rehearsing and when I'm on that stage, uh, you know, when I play in a concert band, when I'm, when I'm playing in that concert band, I'm a musician. Now, I'm not really a musician, but when I'm playing in that concert band, I'm a musician, and this, the, the notes on that page are just coming right into my brain and right out through my fingers. Right? I think that's important to have that, that, even though when I walk away, I know I'm not a musician. I'm just a clarinet player who happens to be lucky to get a part <laughs> in the band or in the jazz band or whatever I'm, I'm doing. So there's a lot of... Um, Self-trickery goes on. You have to trick yourself into believing at a certain level that you are that person. You know, that you, that you have the ability. I trick myself into believing that I'm a superb clarinet player, which I am not. I mean, I'm good enough to play, but I'm... I'm not super duper. I'm super, not super duper. <laughs> There's a difference. There's a big difference. Um, or just think of it. Um, I'm going to take it to another level. Uh, I'm a professor, and I have given hundreds, if not thousands, of lectures. And in doing those, I call on all kinds of things when I'm lecturing. You know, I don't even use lecture notes. I know what I'm going to talk about that day, and I have in my mind a series of things. But the examples that I may call out during the course of a lecture are not ones that I thought of when I said, this is what I'm going to talk about. I, I pull them out of my autobiographical experiences. I pull out something I read. Uh, an article, an experiment that I knew about, and so on. Now, they're, they're all fact-based, you see, but they're my autobiographical experiences that I use to tell a story because, I, because uh, by the way, I, I believe that lecturing is a story. It's not a, a giving a bunch of facts. It's telling a story about it. I'm, I'm telling a story to you now, right? And, 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 but in order to do it, I have a lot of facts that I can call on. I have a lot of autobiographical experiences that I can call on in order to tell you about the nature of memory. That was one question. You got a lot more. <laughs> or not comments. comments. I, and maybe I should um, uh, also, I guess, just kind of reframe uh, the idea that we're, when we create memories in here, we use a very specific technique, but these. Uh, this class was still early in the semester, so they've really only been exposed to it once. So um, just for their sake, I think I'll just re recap the, the technique and then see if we have any questions about that specifically. The way we're creating memories, is there a way that we could enhance it um, using Dr. McGaw's knowledge of, of the way memories are normally created? So what we typically do is we find a, um, a belief system by studying the theme of the, the play first. So we know this is a, this is a show about, uh, you know, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is a, a show about deception by, by many people's um, estimation. So then we say, okay, my character's Brick. And Brick believes that, what does Brick believe about deception? Right? And then we can, because we've read the script, we know he hates lies. He thinks that everyone should tell the truth. So then we say, what happened to Brick in his past that made him decide to hate lies so much? Mm -hmm. And then we use our uh, unconscious imaginations uh, to fantasize about an event that occurred. And then we fill in those details by using a very specific, um, well, not specific, by using sensory information. So we go back to the event and create the details of what's there visually, 
uh, what's there auditorily, what's there kinesthetically, um, and then we even use a, a, uh, uh, what we say to ourselves. What do you say to yourself when you're in that moment? Um, and so then the, the, as actors, we create this event, and then we um, use a physiological trigger from our alba patterns, which we're getting to, um, to create the emotion that occurred at that time. So we physiologically fire off the emotion that occurred as, as we're also thinking about this event. And then we, that, that is how we, once we get the uh, emotion to a full um, you know, induction, if you will, that is how we, that event is stored as our character. Yeah, so you're, you're, creating, you're creating autobiographical memories that did not exist. I mean, mm -hmm. you're just using different words, but that's, that's the way memory works. And you're saying we're using the way memory works to build a character. Right. And that's the way it should be. Now, but I would say if it works properly, you don't have to tell people to feel the emotion at the time it's going to happen. If it really works, it doesn't happen. So if you say... The, the reason that you're uneasy around these kinds of people is because once I stole from a person like that, and nobody knows about it, you know, just my psycho thing, and that's why I'm uneasy. Well, if you, believe, if you, if you create that, that I, I, I stole from somebody, that's going to create the emotion, right? You're going to feel guilty right then if you do it properly. And you're going to feel unhappy and guilty. You know, if you think about it, you create a, a situation and you think that you did something awful, like we say stealing, uh, but it could be something else. Um, uh, you, uh, you imagine that you um, cheated on a very important test. Right. So having, so having said that, does anybody have any questions uh, specifically about about how memories are created and how we're applying this, you know, how we're reconstructing memories. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I could start out by asking one, if, if you guys want to take a minute to look at your notes. I know you have them. Are you ready? Oh, then let's go with yours. <laughs> uh, is, so when we speak or do anything, it's based on memories. Yes, absolutely. And is, there's no mystery about it. There's no, no and nothing else. It's no. just things that we've processed within our lifetime. Yes, that's Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you just demonstrated um, a couple of things. One is you know the language. You know the English language, and you used that to talk with me. And then you had a conceptual idea that you wanted to get across, and you used the language that you had learned in order to do that. So you, you used two completely different systems in your brain in order to, memory systems, in order to do that. Isn't that interesting? And we know that these, uh, we know a lot about them. These, these memory systems are in different parts of the brain and they act in different ways, uh, which is not important for you to, to know here, but that's, that's what I do for a living, is trying to figure out how the brain does all of this. But that's what we do as humans, and, and that's what animals do too. Every animal that's been studied has memory. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because they got to survive, and, and memory is the key to survival. And it's so important that we have in our brains a variety of ways, a variety of types of memory. We have recent memory, we have long-term memory, we have fact memory, we have autobiographical memory. They're all different and we put them together to behave. And so I, that's what we have to do. You have to use um, um, uh, uh, fact memory uh, in order to learn the lines, and it doesn't have to have any meaning at all. You just learn the lines, and then you should use autobiographical memory in order to make sense out of them and create a reason for the lines. It's not recitation, but there has to why. It's not only what did the playwright have in mind when these lines were written, but what did you as a character have in mind when you spoke those lines? That's tough, isn't it? I mean, when, when you agree to have a part, uh, you, you have decided that you're going to take on a new identity. You've got you to erase your own past. 
you have to be you have to create another person temporarily in order to do the job. Now, if you don't, I'm not going to like your play. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you had a question? Uh, I did, yeah. So we do all this work with creating our own false memories. But what about the false memories that our brain creates naturally that we think to be real? Where do some of those come from and why, why are they prevalent? In, in our well, um, mo first of all, most memory is not false. Let's be clear about that. So uh, uh, if I ask you where you were yesterday at this time, do you think you're accurate? Sure. All right. Uh, do you think you remember uh, what you um, what you did um, for your high school graduation? Not off the top of my head. Pardon? Not off the top of my head. Do you remember it? No. Did you wear a cap and gown? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. What color was it? Uh, school colors, maroon. Yeah. Okay. Well, you see, there are a lot of facts there. And the, the, the problem with you're calling false memory is because we have a lot of things in our brains that are similar and we don't always pull them out with accuracy if they're casual things. We tend to have very strong memories of important events and repeated events and we can make mistakes if they are casual events and non-repeated events. So they're not false, it's just says that's, the way, that's the way memory works. We go into our, into our head and we try to pull out the experiences and they're not always correct because there can be confusion. If I said, uh, what did you do the day before graduation and what did you wear? Uh, clothes. Uh, <laughs> but it was cap and ground. For, <laughs> so you could make lots of, was it a, a white shirt? I don't know. Was it a green shirt? I don't know. And, you, and if you say well, it's a green shirt, well, I, you can say it's a false memory. I just say it's an accurate memory because you don't remember the details precisely. The only place where that becomes really important is in legal affairs. So when somebody claims that they saw somebody commit a crime and they testify in court, then there's a difference there between false and, and, and correct memory because somebody's going to go to jail. So that's when it becomes critical. It just doesn't mean false, it means not completely accurate. But we pick on the term false, which I don't like. It's, it's, it's just, in, I mean, for example, do I have uh, false memory of playing in Faust? I might. I think my, my uh, leotards were brown, I'm pretty sure. But um, maybe they were blue, right? Now, in the court of law, that would make a difference because, aha, the person who committed the crime was wearing blue leotards, right? So there it's critical, and that's when you call it false memory. But in this case, it's incomplete memory. I think it's brown. I would bet on it. I'm not sure. Is that false memory? I don't think so. You see. Memories uh, memories are also not perfect. We, we should agree to that. And even uh, Martha Washington uh, probably made a mistake in saying how many slaves she had. You know, and she certainly made a, a mistake when she said they're all well treated. And they were not. Uh, so people misrepresent also. And your character, you may have a character that likes to misrepresent. You know, that's entirely possible. You want to you build a character who's known for telling lies. And then you've got to think about how you would live if you were always trying to create falsehoods. You know, I, uh, maybe that's why I gave up acting. Uh, <laughs> it's hard. It's kind of difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think uh, just to follow up on that, because I think that the spirit of Matt's question um, is, uh, and, and fill this in because I want you to get the answer you want, is is there a, is there a difference between the, the way our mechanism, our, our nervous system store um, memories from real events or the way that we're like imagining events to happen now? I don't think there is, except that we remember we can remember that one is imaginary and one is not, but they can be very strong. They can be very strong. 
I mean, I, I remember being that character in Faust, and that was in uh, 1950. Think about it, 1950. You don't even know that 1950 existed. <laughs> yes. Uh, is, is there anything else you wanted to know about that? No, that answered my question. Yeah. Fine, thank you. Awesome. Is, is your hand, oh, I'm sorry, how about Sharon? Um, I'm wondering is emotional is affect of like affect our memories. And so can you speak up what, if what? Is emotions affect our memories? Because oh, sometimes yes. we say memory it was a good memory or it was a bad memory. Is is memory like we be like we memorize that story, is that because like we believe what we okay. feel? Emotion has two very large and different effects on memory. When you get excited about something, you're going to remember what happened better later on. So emotion will create strong memories of events. And, and we have demonstrated that in rats and mice and humans and all kinds. I can give you some examples of that. Well, let me give you one example before I tell you what the other bad effect is. The other, the, there have been several studies of this kind, not done by me, but by others, um, in which uh, students are given a lecture in class, just a regular classroom lecture. Then after the classroom lecture, half of the students are shown a very boring movie, and half are shown a very emotionally exciting movie. Two weeks later, there's a midterm exam. Guess which group did better on the midterm exam? The group that was excited even after the lecture was over. So the, the content of the lecture doesn't have to be exciting. You just have to get excited somewhere in proximity to the lecture because the brain, the, the brain doesn't know the difference. All the, all the brain does is say, something was very exciting, make a strong memory. Right? <laughs> so there's a lecture which is not exciting, but the film is exciting, and that excitement strengthens the memory of the experience that occurred before because memories are stored rather slowly. And these are, I mean, isn't that interesting? Now, the other is a problem for, um, I think, inex mainly inexperienced actors, uh, and that is Emotional arousal before a test, which, which would mean a recitation or something of that kind, impairs the ability to recall. And we know what, what causes that. What causes that, when you get excited, you re also release cortisol. Cortisol, another stress hormone from the adrenal gland. And cortisol depresses recollection. So if you're about to go on stage, and you are now, you, you get all of a sudden a lump in your throat and you're about to go on stage, that can depress your performance on stage and, and the reason for that is the release of cortisol and we have done that experiments. We have done it with my group and also a group, a uh, former postdoc in Switzerland. Uh, it works in rats and it works when human, with humans and it takes about two hours for that effect to go away. We call it the mid midterm exam effect, mm -hmm. where people think they really know every all the material for the midterm exam, and then they get emotionally excited when they go on the exam and they can't remember. And then two hours later, they, I don't know why I couldn't remember when I was in there, but now, I, have you ever had that happen? Mm -hmm. Happened to me. Mm -hmm. That's cortisol that's doing, that's doing that. So uh, that's the reason that a lot of rehearsing is important so that you can get over the, the cortisol effect. You don't want to be frightened just before you go on stage because that's going to depress your ability to recall what you need to recall when you're on stage. Now, if, you're, if you are better rehearsed, then that's not going to happen. But if you're under-rehearsed, that will happen. And that's, that's uh, one of the basis of stage fright. In, in terms of us storing our imaginary memories for our characters, is there, um, is, is there, is, is there, 
you know, well, first of all, is there a distinction between positive and negative emotions or emotions broken down in a different way, such as? Uh, there's no distinction. There's positive no, there's positive distinction. And, and negative have the same effect. Okay. Yeah, so you can, uh, you can create a happy memory and that will be well remembered or a sad or a depressing memory. But the, the positive or negative doesn't make any difference. It's the degree of it. It's the degree of emotional arousal which is uh, important. Oh, great. Let's you over, over here. So um, I'm and pretty sure that I had a dream of uh, feeling very embarrassed in a public space. You have a bad what? Like bad dreams. Oh, bad dreams. Yeah, and I felt really embarrassed in front of like, a lot of people. And I think I had this dream when I was seven. But then after a certain point, like after like 15 or 16, I started to believe that as a real memory that I actually had, like, that actually happened in my life. And right now I think back and I'm not sure if that's my imagination, if that was my real dream or if that was like a real event that happened. Life. If you want, if you want my guess, you just you just continue to rehearse the same bad dream. Mm -hmm. that the, the, the likelihood of that happening, uh, I think, is low. Uh, I, th I think you're rehearsing just a bad dream over and over again. But I, I, you'd have to know uh, were, were there circumstances such that you could have had those experiences? I, I just don't know. Don't know. Yes. Um, I'm curious um, because I'm struggling a little bit with, um, I, I find it fascinating how we can use our senses to create circumstances and, and evoke um, an emotional, honest, authentic response. I think where I'm getting caught up is recreating the same response. And so I'll try journaling about it. But I feel like, in a way, now that you're talking, it, it, it's almost like turning it into a fact. So I was wondering if there's a way to help teach myself, uh, I don't know if it's just purely rehearsal and repetition, or? Well, repetition is, is the key to so much of this. You know, I, I, can, I can say I'm Mrs. Washington, but in order to really uh, create an embodiment of that, that takes a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, it, you know, it, riding a bicycle takes a lot, learning how to do it takes a lot of work. Learning how to be Mrs. Washington takes a lot of work. It's, it's not that you can just decide to do it. So any of this character, look, acting is tough. That, in my view, acting is really difficult. And it's difficult because it takes so much work to create the character that you need to do so that it's authentic and, and so that, to use the word is often used, so that, so that it projects. When you're on stage, the people in the audience say, that person is real, that's, that's really Mrs. Washington. You know, they, they, they suspend the dis disbelief because you've embodied it so much. And, and it, it's not acting. <laughs> It's, it's not acting, you know, you, we use that, that phrase that when somebody is acting, that's pretending. You've got to get me on pretending. And so you have to learn all about it so that you have Mrs. Washington's autobiographical memory and you have Mrs. Washington's facts to draw on. Uh, if I were playing Mrs. Washington, I'd want to know where I was born. I, I'd want to know where I grew up. I want to know how did I happen to get the accent that I have. You know, I, I'd want to know all kinds of information of that kind, not just learning the lines and, and pretending that I'm Mrs. Washington. Now, that's my take on it, but as I say, I'm not in acting, I'm not in drama, I'm in memory. I work in memory. <laughs> that's so what I, I do for a living, I do memory. <laughs> and you're very good at it. Um, so I want to clarify on that because I want to make sure I understood what you meant. Um, were, were you asking how do you keep it fresh when you do it again, or were you asking how do you keep it real when you do it the second and third time, or neither of those? What were you asking? Um, maybe it's a, I know I got a little lost in how 
opinion, question, but it was, um, I guess I was having trouble uh, reconstruct, like having the same experience every time. And I don't know, it's just, I feel like my emotions can deviate depending on the circumstances. So I don't know if it's just a matter of, I need to make my circumstances crystal clear. Mm -hmm. in order to recreate the same thing? So, but are you talking specifically about directed focus? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah. We can talk about that a little bit more. That's not necessarily Dr. McGaw's wheelhouse. I mean, I'm sure he knows a ton about it, but, but directed focus is, is another part of our training. And that is where, um, as you keep saying, um, you, don't, you don't just say your line. So what we do in here, we've learned one technique. Um, that we ask ourselves, what is it that causes us to say this line? Yeah. And then instead of choosing actions or objectives like um, Stanislavski had done for so long, and everybody does, um, we're looking at it a different way. We're, we're, we're sort of applying pattern completion and pattern deletion and saying, so what was it that we our senses took in? Was it something we see, saw, heard, uh, felt, or said to ourselves that makes us say this line? And so what um, the, what the technique does is, if I, you know, if my first line is, um, you know, where were you today? And you walk in the door and the first thing I notice is that you're, you know, you've got lipstick on your collar. The way I say, where, where, are, where were you today is directly as a result of my focus or my yeah. attention yeah. on the lipstick. So that, that's what she's asking about. And I don't, I don't know if you would have a, um, if you have any, you know, feedback on that. But what she's saying is if, if we're using our technique where we choose to see the lipstick and then the second beat, we um, choose to hear, you know, what we think is a, a, um, a deceitful tone in our partner's or scene partner's voice. That's the second line. Um, how do you keep? How how do you focus? How do you place your attention on those things both times and keep it? I guess what emotionally you know, but, authentic. I mean, this this fits consistently with what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. If you're the female, and a male walks in, let's say husband, lipstick on the collar. Mm -hmm then antennas are raised, you know? Now, it depends upon the background, the circumstances, and so on. Um, maybe the husband is a clown. I think it's got <laughs> lipstick, <laughs> lipstick on the collar because he's smeared the stuff and he's putting on his clown makeup, and the response would be very different. But if, on the other hand, you're the woman, and all of a sudden you think that your husband for the first time has been unfaithful, but you have to have a character that would cause you to be jealous or to be upset. You can't just look and say, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be upset. When I see that, you gotta, you gotta create a feeling so that you will give the right facial expression, the right astonishment, and so on. Uh, that's really what I'm saying. So you're, you're calling on your own autobiographical experience about who you are, you're the wife of this person or the girlfriend of this person or something like that. Now, if you happen to be um, the girlfriend, then the response is very different, isn't it? In walks the man, you've got, and she's, oh, you gotta get that lipstick off your collar, you know? It's a very different kind of response, but what would, what, the question I would ask is, if you were really that person, what do you think your response would be? So it's your job to become really that person. And you think the best way to do that is by memory? So yes, autobiographical, autobiographical memory. memory. Yeah. You've got to create an autobiographical memory. That's what I think. Yeah. You've, you've got to create a real world, a new real world that you can call on. It's sort of a parallel world, if you like. So when you walk on that stage, you're the other person with this other set of backgrounds, other set of values, and so on. Uh, imagine, t take, a, take some horrible example. Suppose you really are a serial killer, or suppose you really are a Nazi, or something like that, and you're playing the part. Uh, that's a tough job because you have to create a, a, an autobiographical life which allows you to do that, and that could be painful. Because it's, it's just, it's not, 
it's not just to use a colloquial term it's not just acting it's not just acting you're you got to live now uh, of course i don't i don't know that what i'm saying really works because i don't do acting i'm telling you from a perspective of a memory person <laughs> that if i were acting i would want to create memories which would then make my behavior appropriate. See? That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah could, Colleen, uh, that could it, um, I have two questions, but I'll do one. Could it be dangerous to um, do that, to kind of create different memories for yourself? Um, and how, how would that affect your behavior in the future if you're creating no. you know different lives and I, I think it came up in a discussion before is there like a cap on you know how much <laughs> no. how many memories we can no. have as a person no because um, no it, it, it's no problem at all because we already have these different styles uh, your behavior with me is very different from your behavior with your friends when you go out for for coffee uh, it, we already have different styles of behavior under different settings your behavior is, with me right now is quite different from your behavior when you go back to your family and have Thanksgiving dinner or something like that. We all have these different styles of behavior that I, I'm different with you than I am when I'm, pl I'm playing with my great grandchild, you know. Uh, we, ha we have these different styles of behavior under different circumstances already. They're already there. And well, all we're asking, uh, and, and, and of course we have them because we live them. And all I'm asking is, if you're going to have this part in the play, now you have to have another one. So and it's you can not just really a different person. It's just you under different circumstances. Yes, but you under different circumstances are, diff a, different are, are a different person. Right. That's what you're saying. Yes. We become different people. Yeah, different yes, people. absolutely. Interesting. Absolutely. Nice. Cool. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> So because we do a lot of work with staying in the moment, reacting to various stimuli, yeah. uh, I was wondering what, like, let's say, what would the relationship between the attention span that we use and our working memory, or our, let's say short-term memory, I think. Give me an example of a problem so I can see if I can understand. Uh, must not be framing this right. Uh, when we think about a memory, do we, let's say, react to the stimuli we remember about that memory? Is that how we really recall them? Um, Are you asking well, about me, the trigger I'm, of the I'm, memory? I'm, I'm, right. What I, let's say I remember frolicking through a field of flowers when I was younger. Yeah. Is what, would I remember that, let's say, if I went by and walked by a flower shop? Is that what triggers a memory? That's a great question for us. Oh. Um, lots of things could, could trigger that. Uh, just thinking about it for a moment, you, you could, that memory could be triggered when you go for a ride in the car, for example. And you say, oh yeah, I remember when I, last time I, we went by some beautiful flowers, that happens. Uh, let, me, let me also <clears throat> express a lot of ignorance here. Uh, my view is that we know about 1% of what we need to know about mm -hmm. memory, despite 150 years of, of studying it. Um, we don't know, for example, how memories are retrieved. We, we do not even have a theory about how memories, how we gain access to memories in the brain. We know a lot, an awful lot about how they're made. We focus on that. And, and I know a lot about it because that's been the focus of, of my long career on this. I don't know how they're pulled out of the brain. We, we don't know that. So when we know more about that, maybe we can be more helpful on, on that score. Uh, but we, we do know that similarity counts a lot. So that w w you mentioned false errors. Similarity can create what you call false memory where something is similar to something else, we can get confused about that. It can also help us to relate things. And poetry is based on that, 
where something is related to something else and you, you create poetry out of it, although it's not real. Um, and how the brain does that is just a mystery at, at, at the present time. You know, how can you, you what, what goes on when I, when I ask you what your name is? What goes on in the brain? You get this information, I did it, it came in through your auditory system, went into the brain, and you access something in here and out of it comes a verbal response, which is a motor system. It's an incredible mystery. But you gotta use that mystery. Anyone else? Because I have, uh, go ahead, Con. Um, so, in this class, we're learning about having one of the reasons that we speak be something that we say to ourselves. But in our heads, sometimes it's not really saying something to ourselves. It's like, it seems like a mystery. So, how can you... <laughs> ah, sweet mystery of life. At last I found you. At last I know the secret of it all. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I got to work at it. I, I, I don't. We don't know how that happens in the brain. We, ju we just don't know. Uh, uh, look, what I, what I'm, the way I look at this is, is really strange, isn't it? You have a life. You have all kinds of what we call semantic knowledge, knowledge about the world. Um, and you have an awful lot of memories of your own experiences which have not been rehearsed. They just, things happen and the brain responds to them and then you have the things that you have specifically rehearsed. You know how to drive a car or ride a bicycle, you know, uh, uh, the letters A, B, C, D, E and so on. It's all that semantic knowledge. And then on top of that, you have these unique experiences that create who you are, okay? What I'm, believe and what I'm saying is that when you are acting you have to pull yourself out of that set of beliefs that you have and use all of that somatic knowledge that you have to create another belief about yourself and work on that so that so that a lot of things will come naturally if you do that if, if you believe that um, that uh, you are in Texas the play is set in Texas, you believe that you are in Texas, then that's going to influence a lot of your decisions, a lot of your actions, and even your pronunciations are going to be influenced by that. And you live in this little bubble over here. Now that doesn't mean you have, don't have the other one. In the same way that I behave differently with you than I do with my grandchildren, than I do with, with uh, my girlfriend and so on. I, they're, they're just they're different styles of behavior with each one of those. It's not consistent. What, what you're seeing with me right now is not me. It's me here. And when you go on stage, it's got to be that person there, not you. You got to, you, you got to, you substitute. You got an alter ego over here, and it's got to be real. And it's got to have a set of memories and beliefs. That's why I think that autobiographical memory is such a key to this. You have to create a world about this person. So that when you speak, and the words you use, the phrases you generate, are natural for that character. That's my take. And that's why it's so hard. So a follow-up question to that, would that mean some, we might only need, because you were saying before the most important memories, or the biggest, most significant memories are connected with an emotional arousal. Right, right, right. So maybe we only need one or two. Emotional experiences to have? No, I think well, I mean, I don't know. Depending on how close we are to the character, I don't know. Well, like, uh, how many if, do we need? If, <laughs> if, if, if I were your coach or I were your director and you got a part in the play I'm directing, and um, let's say the part is uh, your rancher's wife, right? It's set on a ranch. And uh, so I'd say, um, where were you born? Yeah, do you have brothers and sisters? How old are they? 
They can't be the ones you have. Right, you gotta, I want to know what your family life was. I want to know where you lived, uh, how many grades of school you, you had. Uh, did you go to church? I want to know all about your life as a person who lived on the farm. And uh, you got to create it. It's just not that you get the position of a person who's on the farm and you learn some lines and you learn to walk across the stage. If you want to really project that, you have to create that person and exude the autobiographical experiences of that person. Um, you don't, you're not shocked when you see a calf being born, because you see that all the time. And as a city person, you would be shocked to see a calf being born. You know, it's just a lot of things like that that I think you have to create, whatever the part is. Um, and if I had known all of this when I was a graduate student, maybe I'd still be <laughs> in <laughs> I, drama. I, I have one more thing I'd just like for you to touch on, and then we should absolutely thank you for your time. Um, and that is uh, uh, the sensory motor, uh, sensory motor system in relation to our memory. Um, one of the things that uh, we use is we always envision what the character, when we're creating these, these memories, we envision what the character is doing if there are movements. Um, is, there a, is there a benefit to that? And, and, and can that be, you know, uh, is there any way to uh, take better advantage of that? Or? Sure, uh, but it, it follows just from everything I've just said. Uh, let's suppose the, um, uh, the uh, play is set in Naples. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, 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 don't, you don't say, uh, what's going on here? You, you know, you, you, and you got to live it. I used to live in Italy, so I, I know some of these. Uh, and they've got to come naturally, you see. You, you, and, and this is part of the autobiographical experience. You have, you have to become the character who displays emotion in, in a way which is different from the way that we display emotions here. Um, and you react to things in a different way. I mean, it, it culturally, it, it's not just other countries, but different parts of the United States. There are huge cultural differences in the way people respond to things. And uh, you have to, have to know what they are. Uh, a, a, a play that's set in New England um, would have a different set of individuals than a play that is uh, set in the Montana because they have different backgrounds. They have different, they have different personal experiences. Their lives are very different. And I think you have to get into the character and say, what are the experiences that, that, that lead to these autobiographical memories that you have of, of growing up and so on if you were in New England or you were in Montana? And, and I just picked those as examples and they're very different. And, and then you go to uh, Germany or you go to Italy or something you're playing, or somebody who has come from Italy. Let's say you have a, a recent immigrant from Sicily in a part. How do you get inside the head of that person? That's tough. That's tough. In, in terms of the way the brain stores information, is, is uh, imagining the move, a, a particular set of movements or movements, is that beneficial yes. in terms of storing the memory? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Plus, yes. uh, is it on the same level as emotion in terms of storing the memory, or more or less? Well, we don't know about that. Okay. Um, we, we do know there are some studies, for example, that, uh, from athletics that show that there is a significant benefit from imagining the act that is going to be performed in uh, gymnastics, for example. Uh, that, that people who spend time imagining their act actually do better when they perform it. And uh, I was very skeptical of that literature at first, but that literature is, has been confirmed. So imagination, is that's part of building the skill. You, know, you imagine that you are Martha Washington, and then you imagine what skills she has. I don't know. Canning, <laughs> canning goods. I don't know what Washington, <laughs> Washington did. Uh, or managing the slaves, I guess, you know. Uh, anyway, that's, that's the, key, the key to all of this, folks, from my humble experience, is memory. It 
really is the key to all of this because uh, you are you are learning how to behave on the stage, but you're also trying to crawl in the memory of your character in order to be on stage. And, and uh, it doesn't work if you don't do that. And it comes across as imitation and fake. And, and you gotta, you got to make your part look least like imitation as you possibly can. You got to make it when you walk across the stage that people believe you really are that person. The best way to do that is to believe that you really are that person with that person's memories and so on. I want to say something else about that. Um, uh, one can gain, gain the impression that if you're running in a long-term play that it, it becomes uh, automatic and it loses all the things I've just said. No, because that person is now that person on stage. And so the person on stage now has all of the skills, all of the background information, all of the autobiographical memory of that person while they're on stage. They don't lose it. And it does, it's not just mechanical that the movements are there and the words come out. The, the living part of it is the same throughout, or should be, or it's not going to work. Now, if I'm so smart, how come I didn't stay in drama? Huh? <laughs> <laughs>